Hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. This time round, we're uh, looking at a car that has actually been uh, in the background on quite a few of the previous videos because it's been here for a lot of restoration work and it's garnered a lot of interest and it was almost inevitable that one day we were going to end up doing a video about it. Well, today's the day. And that car is the Lamborghini LM002. Great big monster of a thing, really. Not by modern car standards, but certainly in the 1980s. And it's probably the car where there's been most skullduggery, um, inappropriate use of funds, um, deception, um, failure, resurrection, reinvention. I don't think I can think of many cars that fall into those categories as much as this one does combined. It started off in the 1970s as a military project. There were two companies in the US vying for a military contract to replace the Jeep, the ubiquitous Jeep. And that was called High Utility Motorized Military Vehicle, or as we more commonly know it, Humvee. And there was a contender for that brought about. Lamborghini decided they were in terrible trouble in 1977 financially. Paradoxically, the most exotic car in their range became their bread and butter, their dollar earner, because people just kept buying them. So they, they kept on making them. So their most expensive, esoteric, small production car actually was their saviour in a way, really, and continued Lamborghini through the 70s regardless. But there were various other things going on in the background. The, let's start at the beginning. BMW um, approached Lamborghini because they didn't have the the sort of um, low volume production facilities to take on the M1 car, which I covered a few videos ago. We had one here in the workshop. Great car. BMW's only road going supercar of that era, really. And the Italian government gave Lamborghini a lot of money uh, to help them gear up for making the M1 on BMW's behalf. It was styled by Giugiaro. The chassis design was done by Ingegnere Gian Paolo De Lara, who I also interviewed a few videos back with the Italian job Mura. And it was a very much a collaborative effort. But Lamborghini had their sights set on increasing their production capacity and increasing their throughput, increasing their money, basically, because they were broke in 1977. Um, so what they did was they, they set their sights on uh, the Humvee American military project and they came up with a 4x4, a big 4x4, which became known as the Cheetah. One of the big problems was it had an AMC, American Motors Corporation 360 cubic inch V8, which is about six litres in British money, and that was right out the back. It was over the rear axle overhang, sitting out the back like a Porsche 911. Problem was, as a military vehicle, it didn't necessarily go where you pointed it or where you steered it because all the weight was at the back and if you mashed the accelerator in a desert military manoeuvre, the front end would lift and you'd end up in Notting Hill instead of um, somewhere else and uh, you'd end up saying, well, you know, we're here now so you might as well surrender, which doesn't go down terribly well in a London suburb. Um, so that didn't work. So. Uh, Back to the drawing board. Um, in the meantime, an American, another American company uh, came up with a concept for the Humvee principle. And net result was the whole house of cards for Lamborghini and the first American company and AMC, because they went bust in 1977 as well. It was a perfect storm of failure, really. Um, Lamborghini bet the farm on this um, Humvee project. So much so that they used all the money they got from the Italian government to make the BMW M1 and diverted it towards their 4x4 project with disastrous results, really. BMW pulled the plug, they said enough is enough, they took the project back in-house and the M1 became the fantastic car that it was. And that could be the end of the story, except it isn't because uh, the Mimran brothers Two brothers bought the assets of Lamborghini from the Italian government in 1980 and they approached Giulio Alfieri, another brilliant Italian engineer, extremely talented, just sublimely gifted uh, gentleman. And he uh, came to Lamborghini from Maserati. He was the technical director of Maserati for many years, developing some wonderful cars. He went to Lamborghini and the Mimran brothers said, what about this 4x4 project? 
that we've got here. Whatever happened to that? Can you do something with it? So this is where things get more wacky and more uh, offbeat and more pioneering in a way, uh, in, in sort of the only way that Lamborghini could. So it was, it was failure, disaster, uh, wrong appropriation of money up until this point, and then the brilliance and the genius kicked in. And they took a Countach V12 engine and they put it at the front with a very, very beefy ZF manual gearbox and transfer box, very similar to the one you, Aston Martin used in the V8 Vantage, for example. And they created this. Well, there's a little bit of a wrinkle in the story even then, because Lamborghini were quietly making powerboat engines going right back to the 1960s. They found that their V12s were extremely usable as powerboat engines. And they developed a new family of engines from six to eight litres capacity, V12s. Um, and they plumped one of those in these, and that was called the LM004. Uh, and that was, that was a seriously trick car, but um, the eventual production derivative was this, the LM002, with a, originally a 5.2 litre Countach engine. By the time it really got in its stride, it was the Quattrovalvol engine, again developed by Giulio Alfieri, which was uh, allegedly one of the most thermodynamically efficient internal combustion engines of its time in the world. Fantastic achievement, the QV uh, Countach engine. So they put that in this. It's got independent suspension all round, no live axles like Range Rovers or American offerings of the period. You were lucky if you got coil springs instead of cart springs on cars like this, never mind independent suspension. And this vehicle weighs three tonnes of anybody's money. So if you put a, a five odd litre, 400 odd horsepower V12 in this, which was detuned a bit to give more torque, you're gonna end up with an amazing car um, which is still fast for its time. So this car does anywhere between 180, 18, and 125 miles an hour, which doesn't sound a lot these days. We live in the age of mega four by fours, but this is a big proper sand plugging four by four. This is not just a soft rotor as it's called, where you can venture across a lawn to drop the kids off at school. This is a proper serious sand dune bashing car. And yet it's got this whopping V12 in it. And I have to confess, they passed me by for a number of years because I, I wasn't really, didn't know what to do with them in my mind. I couldn't pigeonhole them. But that's part of the essence of Lamborghini. They don't like being pigeonholed and quite right too. So this vehicle sort of passed me by for a number of years. I didn't particularly like the look of it. It's a great car. They actually upped the 4x4 high, ultra high performance 4x4 game in the 1980s to a whole new level. This was as pioneering a car in a way as the Countach was in 1971. It was out there. So we've done a lot of restoration work on this car. I'm gonna give it its very first road test today. We have not been on the road in this car. We've set the whole thing up. The suspension's all been restored, brakes, the body has been restored. This has all been repainted and carefully leveled up. It's a really sharp car, this now, but how does it drive? Well, let's take it on the road and see how this three ton, 120 mile an hour car performs. Okay, well, the uh, things have moved on and this is a fuel injection engine. It's an electronic fuel injection engine. It's in that very narrow window of the early 1990s when things started to get really complicated electronically, but we hadn't yet moved to 1996 with OBD2 as it's called, onboard diagnostics, where you plug in the scanner and it tells you, you know, what color socks you're wearing and everything else and also the faults on the car. But, um, we're in the age of flash codes, which is nothing to do with anything unsavory and raincoats. This is um, actually to do with the engine telling you that it flashes a number of times an engine management light on the dashboard, and then it supposedly corresponds to a fault on the engine. Very tricky, actually. It was a really awkward time, awkward window of time, because the complexity of engine management systems was coming on, but the diagnostics took a while to catch up. Um, having said that, we did have an engine management light, a flash code. We've replaced a sensor on the engine and that's gone out. So happy days. But what we're going to do 
As I say, the engine is an electronic injection engine. It's essentially, as all V12s are, two six-cylinder engines independently. So you've got an inlet plenum chamber here, same on that side, and throttle bodies, one for each bank of six in the V. So what Alex is going to do, our, our, uh, our young engine tuner in the making, is to remove the, in this chamber here to gain access to the throttle bodies to balance the engine because it's hunting slightly at idle. The revs are just wavering a little bit. And I reckon with a little bit of trickery, we can get no pressure, Alex. None at all. Um, we can get rid of that. So uh, Alex is going to take the plenum chamber off and then we're going to get to work on it. Oh, that can pull that off again. That's my contribution. <laughs> Do you want a hand? It's not going to come off that one there. There we are, as easy as that. So what we've revealed here is the two throttle bodies. You can see that there's a small throttle here and a big throttle. The reason uh, Lamborghini did this was because um, when you're driving at small throttle openings, accelerating and driving around town and in traffic, you don't want to suddenly unleash a load of horsepower. So you have this tiny throttle just for um, low, low demand work. And then as soon as you want to open the taps up more, the second throttle kicks in. This is quite normal these days. A lot of manufacturers do that, but it's a little trick just to graduate how the power is uh, administered by the engine. And first things first, like I did on a previous video with the Ferrari 456, I'm going to make sure that we actually get full throttle travel because there's nothing robs an engine like this that's in otherwise good health of more power more than actually the throttle's not opening fully. So Alex, can you just uh, mash it like you mean it, please, onto the floor? That's full throttle. That's full. Yeah, we've got full throttle on that one. And again, yeah, perfect. Okay, so we got full full throttle there. Okay, so we're going to um, synchronize the throttles now and have a listen to them with um, this trusty Lamborghini tool. It's very similar to the similar Porsche and Ferrari tools. Um, that's a highly sophisticated and expensive bit of kit. And we're going to use this as an acoustic sensing device for um, measuring the input of each bank of six. Okay, so if you listen to the hiss right. from each side, and let's see if it's equal, okay? okay. Oh. There you go. We're going from the, the bigger one at the top, yeah? The bigger uh, whichever one. one's hissing, wherever the hissing's coming from. Now the other yeah, side. You can hear try, it. try the other side. Should be the same. Yeah. What what do you think? A bit more sharper from that one. About right, let's have a point. listen. Yeah, you're right. That one's louder. Right, Alex, we've undone the lock nut mm -hmm. on that. So what we need to do now is just turn that in a little bit to quieten the noise down. Right, okay. So if we start it up, maybe a couple of flats, yeah. and just have a listen to that. That sounds smoother already, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, have a listen again with your trusty hose right pipe. That's the Venturi there, that little hole, okay? Still sounds a bit sharper, isn't it? Still a bit louder, I'd say.
does, doesn't it? Mm. Okay, do you want to wind that screw in just a little bit more? A bit more, yeah. Watch the fan. Not too much. Yeah? Yeah, so much. There we are, mm -hmm. spot on that. Got that. The man from Del Monte says yes. <laughs> okay, All through. there we go. Right. right, that's just idling so much more smoothly now. It, it, you can hear it's happy. Yeah. Uh, so we'll box that off, right. tighten the lock nut off, and then I'll take it on the road. Okay, Good job. Ready? Oof, the clutch is a bit sharp on this. Um, there's a lot going on under here with uh, transfer boxes and uh, gearboxes and uh, V12s and four camshafts and 48 valves. Um, we take a lot of this for granted on modern cars because they are refined to within millimetres of their life. But um, it's quite funny because I feel really scrunched up against this pillar here. It's just a virtue or whatever of its design. Virtue isn't really the word I would use, but it feels quite narrow here. My shoulder is uh, up against the post, and yet you've got this enormous wide swathe of dashboard and this huge centre console here. Um, but uh, quite a lot of cars of this era were like that. I'm thinking of Aston Martin V8s. They have a very big centre console and quite a narrow uh, bit between the seat and the door trim. But um, the ride is very smooth. Uh, it's, we, we've redone all the suspension, obviously, so it's as good as it could or should be. Uh, and it's got a, a very special kind of hydro-pneumatic self-leveling system on the front end, which, uh, which really does work very well. And again, it's how many cars like this? I mean, this car was unique in the 1980s with its big V12, proper off-road credentials. Um, but uh, it does, yeah, it does just work, but it, it, it feels a big vehicle to drive. Uh, the funny thing is, it's about the same size as uh, external dimension-wise as a new Land Rover Defender, the five-door Defender. Um, but uh, yeah, it's quite happy just to, uh, to poodle along. Everything's behaving itself. Apart from the temperature gauge, which seems to have stopped working. Don't you just love Italian auto electrics? Okay, well that was working. Oh, joy of joys. We'll have to have a look at that when we get back. And this great big ZF gearbox. Um, very strong unit. It was one of the strongest manual gearboxes of the 70s and 80s. Um, <clears throat> Maserati used it, uh, Aston Martin used it, as I said earlier, um, and, uh, but it's, it's quite refined, there's not that much, little bit, but not a huge amount of gear, gear wine. Transfer boxes of this era um, always have noise uh, in them, from whether they're Range Rovers or uh, whatever, always have a bit of gear wine, but it's, it's not bad. The funny thing is I would describe this as a typical Lamborghini in one way. Uh, you've got to concentrate driving it. It's not the sort of car you can just switch off at the end of the working day um, and jump in and drive home and, and think about a thousand and one other things. It demands your attention, it demands your concentration to keep it on the road. Uh, it really is. The steering is pretty direct but um, you're aware of the fact that there's a lot going on. Um, so I'm just going to now it's warmed up. Although the temperature gauge isn't working, it is warmed up. Uh, let's just open the taps on this three-ton behemoth and see how it goes. Lovely 
noise. It's hard to believe that this is the same engine as the Countach Quattro Volvo because the exhaust system is very well silenced on this uh, vehicle by comparison. As is the induction roar really, uh, this is the injection engine so it's, it hasn't got the big carburettors on it like the, uh, the, the Euro spec cars. But um, even so, it's still quick, uh, for so it's sort of slightly mind-bending to be in a 1980s vehicle um, that's as big as this and goes as well, and for that matter, handles. I mean, it's it's not uh, it's not bad at all around the bends, really. I wouldn't suggest you start bouncing off the door handles, but it does feel. It does feel confidence inspiring. It's so interesting because the Countach is actually half the weight of this vehicle. Uh, a Countach QV comes in at about 1490 kilos and this is 3000 so it, the engine is pulling literally twice as much weight as it is in a Countach. Uh, but it still does a respectable job. I mean, a Countach engine is hardly ever extended. Uh, I do have one or two customers with Countaches who do drive their cars very fast, actually. Um, less said about that, the better. But, um, but yeah, this engine's having to work a lot harder in this car for sure. But this is a very pleasant experience. It's, um, and considering this is the first time this car's been on the road since we've done all that work, uh, I'm very, very happy with it. The steering doesn't pull to the left or the right. Uh, brakes are even bedding in nicely already. They're starting to just get a tiny bit of bite and the paddle travel's starting to reduce. It's, uh, this is fun. You're never gonna win any, uh, any drag races with this, but it's just, great that nice v12 in front of you um, it's quite smooth and quiet uh, the wheels and tires are, are, are big on this they have a big rolling radius but um, nevertheless it doesn't feel I don't have the the same feeling as I do in a, an early Range Rover of, of which I love um, those early Range Rovers with the the live front and rear axles you don't get the feeling in this that the, uh, you're fighting with the axle uh, at the front and the back. It's sort of bouncing around and dictating where you are on the road. It does feel very planted with that four-wheel independent suspension. And again, I must state what a remarkable achievement uh, four-wheel independent suspension was in the 1980s on a genuine off-road vehicle. Um, I'm sure there are other vehicles that fall into that category but not with a 400 knot horsepower engine. Um, just a really intoxicating and unusual combination. This is a car I've underestimated. I will hold my hand up. It's growing on me. I think it's big enough actually, but it's growing on me anyway. concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. Hope you've enjoyed it. Please like, please subscribe, please share. And I do want to just mention a big thank you to all our subscribers who've tipped us over the 100,000 mark in less than 24 months with just 36 videos. It's you that has been the lifeblood of this channel. Thank you very much indeed.